it is my great pleasure to be here today uh, giving this seminar. And um, with the help of the technology, uh, we'll, we'll try to keep this as interactive as possible. Like Kathy said, please uh, ask questions as, as we go. I, uh, I really would like to interact with you and make sure that I answer any questions that you may have. I really hope that you learned something today, uh, but I really don't want you to learn to sleep in your desk. So anyway, uh, you know, <laughs> webinars, <laughs> uh, webinars are interesting. I, I wish I could be uh, seeing you, but uh, that, that's not the case. So anyway, I hope that you know by the end of the seminar, you do not look like this guy here who seemed to have been pretty bored uh, during the webinar. So anyway, uh, jokes aside, so to give you a little bit of uh, uh, an overview of what I expect to present to you today. So I'm just going to briefly discuss or give you some context about the um, availability and the potential use of the multiple automated health monitoring systems that we have today. But then I'll spend uh, the majority of the time discussing some of the research that my group has been conducting in recent year in, in this whole area and show you results from a couple of the studies that we have done initially to figure out uh, you know, if some of these commercial systems uh, were accurate and then how to integrate the systems into uh, their health management. And finally, I'll discuss um, um, a little bit of the, you know, some of the ideas that we have as far as integrating the systems into day-to-day -day operation for uh, health monitoring and management of dairy cows. So I'm sure that most of you are well aware that today we have many different technologies in particular most of them sensor technologies that can be used to monitor different behavioral, physiological and performance parameters from cows. And through monitoring of those parameters, try to predict both in the short and the medium term, the health of cows. And with that, you know, the most, you know, important aspect of these technologies try to alert farm personnel when cows may be suffering from a particular health disorder. So farm personnel can act on those cows, you know, through treatments or any other management intervention that could help those cows. So we have a lot of different sensor technologies today and, and they can be either attached or inside the cow as well as be part of the facilities in which cows live or are milked. And I'm not going to discuss much about the different technologies that are available. Uh, I'll spend a little more time when I talk about the research that we have done uh, on those ones that we have been working with. But uh, more than anything, I, I think that it's more important to think about what, what is the potential or what are some of the potential benefits of adopting these technologies for dairy herd management. So here you have a list of a few things that uh, we think about when, when we think about the potential benefits of bringing these technologies on farm. And uh, probably one of the most important ones is to uh, you know, reduce the burden associated with current programs. So can we replace some of the work or all the work that we do today to monitor cows with, with these technologies. So can we have these technologies do the initial screening and then allow farm personnel to just focus on those animals that need attention? Another important question is uh, whether or not these technologies offer a more consistent and objective evaluation of cow health. So as I mentioned, most of these systems will monitor physiological, behavioral, and performance parameters. And for the most part, they, they will always measure these parameters the same way. So there is an opportunity there that through this very objective measurements that are conducted always the same way, 
we may be able to uh, do a little bit better at the time of identifying cows with disorders. So one of the problems or one of the issues that a lot of dairy farms may have with their current methods, in particular when humans are involved, is that many times we have uh, you know, human subjectivity or human biases at the time of uh, monitoring animals. And we also have issues with compliance with protocols, right? That protocols are not followed properly, cows are not checked all the time. And if they are checked all the time, there is uh, a potential for cows to not be checked always the same way uh, by the same person or by different people. So there's probably an opportunity there with the fact that these technologies are always measuring these parameters the same way and all the time. Of course, they, they may be somewhat wrong in a way. I mean, they may not be perfect in terms of their accuracy to measure a parameter, but for most of these uh, systems or technologies, what matters most are changes in patterns rather than the absolute values that we obtain from them. So another potential benefit is the possibility of improving the accuracy and timing of disease diagnosis. And this is of course related to what I just mentioned, uh, but also you know, the fact that most of them are monitoring cows 24 seven. And in some cases, some of the changes, some of the biological changes that cows go through when they suffer from a health disorder, they may be uh, identified a little bit earlier through these parameters. So some of these uh, parameters may change uh, somewhat earlier than the clinical signs that cows express when they are going through a health disorder. So there is there uh, a potential opportunity to be a little bit better able to identify some cows and potentially identify these cows slightly earlier than clinical diagnosis as is conducted uh, the way that we do it today. Of course, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword and an area uh, that we are still trying to understand uh, quite well. So there is also the opportunity to reduce the disruption of cow normal behavior. And by this, I refer to basically the fact that many times to identify those cows that need attention on the dairy farm, personnel need to check uh, either all cows in a pen or a majority of the cows in a pen or in a group, either through uh, locking them up in headlocks or sorting them in, uh, um, with sort gates and put them in, uh, in uh, pens where they can be evaluated, whether with palpation rails or with headlocks. So there's a possibility there to disrupt the, the normal behavior of cows, right? So instead of having cows go back to their pens and their stalls and lay down, or if they prefer to eat or interact with other cows in their groups. So we, we are disrupting them in a way by keeping them isolated or locked up uh, during the time that they need to be evaluated. So that's one another benefit that uh, it's probably important today from a farm management perspective, but may also be important from a cow well-being and from you know, the perception of consumers and the things that we do with cows and so on. And last but not least, there are always uh, other potential uses of these technologies beyond health. Uh, a lot of these technologies also uh, generate alerts for reproductive events such as estrus, uh, you know, some of them are, you know, being developed to have a pregnancy and, and other uh, reproductive events. So there may be also value on, on, on that. So it's not just about health, but also repro. In some cases for nutritional management, uh, there are some parameters that are associated with, uh, you know, uh, feeding behavior, ruminal health of cows and so on. And, you know, they, they could offer uh, some useful data for general nutrition and management, and also for uh, monitoring the well-being of cows, like you know some of those that monitor resting time, and uh, you know anything that is an indicator of cow well-being or overall cow health could be used as you know data to either uh, monitor the well-being of cows as well as to in a way uh, certify the uh, the health status and the well-being of cows. 
So anyway, so these are just some of the things or some of the opportunities that arise from the use of this type of technology. Of course, there probably are a lot more. Uh, these are just some that, that we are interested in and we have been evaluating. Unfortunately, uh, there, there's not a lot of data. Of course, there's a growing amount of data, but you know, a few years back when we started working in this area, there was not a lot. Uh, there were a lot of open questions as far as uh, the potential values of these technologies. And there were some key questions that we uh, became interested on, on trying to answer. And uh, among those, uh, for example, the, the ability of these technologies to identify cows with health disorders. So how, how well do they perform at the time of picking up those animals that need attention in a group of cows? Uh, as important as the ability to identify cows is also the timing at which cows are identified, right? So uh, it is important that if alerts are going to be generated uh, that will draw the attention of farm personnel, that they are generated at, at a relatively reasonable time in relationship to the occurrence of a clinical health disorder. So it is not too late that any treatment intervention may not be effective, but also that it's not too early that when farm personnel check the animal, uh, then you know there are no clinical signs and it's hard to decide what to do with the animal. And of course, uh, you know, we were very interested and we're still interested on, on better understanding the, the patterns of change of the parameters monitored before, during, and right after the occurrence of health disorders as a way to, uh, you know, better understand how diseases affect them and how we can improve alerts and the use of these systems in general. So in order to try to answer some of these questions, we conducted a, a field study a few years back at, at a commercial dairy farm with one of the first commercially available technologies for health monitoring. And it was one that in particular, it monitored two uh, behavioral or physiological parameters and, and those were rumination time and physical activity. So this system in particular was the heat and rumination system from uh, SCR, which is one of the companies that commercialize, uh, commercializes this type of products. And uh, here you have a picture of uh, this, the sensor that monitored both parameters was a, what we call a neck tag. So it's, it's a sensor uh, that goes attached to the neck of the cow. And for those of you that are familiar with the system, you will probably notice that this was the first generation of the technology, the one that used uh, uh, a microphone to monitor rumination time. But anyway, so we had uh, two basic questions about the, um, uh, the technology. And one of those was, what will be the performance of, of this system to identify cows with health disorders? So will there be alerts for cows that suffer from health disorders or not? And then if there were alerts, when did they happen? in relationship to the timing of clinical diagnosis. So uh, I'm not going to explain in detail what we did for this experiment, but uh, we enrolled, uh, you know, like uh, 1,200 cows. We followed them during the early lactation period when they were most likely to develop health disorders. And then we retrospectively determined whether or not there were alerts from the system and when this alert happen in relationship to the timing of clinical health disorders, as well as we, we also look at the patterns of the parameters of interest, and I'll, and I'll show you some of that. But uh, again, so two very simple questions. So performance, so are there alerts or not? And if there are alerts, when do they occur in relationship to the timing of clinical diagnosis? For anybody who is uh, interested in learning uh, a lot more than what I'll present today, there are three papers published in the Journal of Dairy Science that you have here. And there are a lot of details there about the way that we did uh, this experiment and the results and our interpretation. But the, uh, the main result or, or the most important ones uh, were again for performance. And here you have the data for what we consider to be metabolic and digestive disorders. In this case, we have displaced mason, ketosis, and indigestion. And there are two numbers that I'm reporting here that are, are critical. 
One of those is the sensitivity of the alerts or the um, ability of the system to generate an alert for those animals that did have a clinical health disorder. So uh, that's uh, one of the outcomes of interest. And then this other one here on the right is basically the timing of the alerts is how many days in relationship to clinical diagnosis, there was an alert for those animals that did have an alert. And any time that you see a negative number, that's, that's a good thing in a way for the system because that meant that the alert was generated earlier than clinical diagnosis by personnel. So um, in general, the, uh, the sensitivity of the alerts uh, or the system was really good. It varied anywhere from 98% for displays of amazon to 89% for indigestion, uh, combining them all together to have a larger N, and also because most of these disorders are interrelated and in fact, uh, for example, a lot of the cows that had the aid also had clinical ketosis. So the overall sensitivity of the alerts was 93%, which is, you know, to us, reasonable. And then in terms of timing of the alerts, so it varied anywhere from about half a day before for indigestion to as early as three days before for displays of amazon. So some cows had alerts quite early. Uh, you know, some cows uh, had alerts as early as five days before the A, for example, whereas some cows had the alert on the same day of clinical diagnosis. And combining all the events uh, for metabolic and digestive disorders, on average, the alerts happen about two days before clinical diagnosis. So in general, it, it, it seemed like the performance of this technology, of this system in particular that uses these two parameters, uh, to generate alerts was, was reasonable for metabolic and digestive disorders. It was a little bit of a different story for mitritis. So for mitritis, uh, the overall sensitivity was uh, 55%, as you can see it here. And uh, one of the things that is important to keep in mind, and, and I'll get back to this as I discuss more of the data, is that um, you know, the, the, cent the overall incidence of mitritis in the study was pretty high because uh, we thought that uh, the, uh, the diagnosis of mitritis was pretty stringent and, um, you know, any minimal sign of uterine infection and mitritis and, and the cow was considered to have an event of mitritis. So uh, you, you will see why, why I say this in a moment. Uh, but anyway, so overall, uh, it was 55% sensitivity. And for those animals for which there was an alert, the alert was generated 1.2 days earlier. However, when, when we saw these results for sensitivity, we started wondering about uh, this and, and why it would be so low. So we, we started looking for ways to um, separate cows in different levels of severity of the disorder, in this case, mitritis. And one way that we found to separate cows in two levels of severity was through the treatment that they received after diagnosis. So it happened that during the experiment, farm personnel uh, used two different types of antibiotic treatment to uh, treat cows that they deemed to have different levels of severity. And those cows that they considered to have a, more of a milder case of mitritis, that the uh, systemic health of the, the health of the animal in general, or the cow was not systemically affected. So those animals were treated with uh, cephal cephalosporin antibiotic, whereas um, animals that farm personnel considered to have a, a more severe case of mitritis were treated mostly with ampicillin. So, and when we looked at the sensitivity of these uh, two groups of animals, then we, we observed a pretty good separation. As you can appreciate, the sensitivity was actually even lower for uh, the cows that in theory had a milder case of the disorder, whereas it was 83%, uh, which is a pretty substantial improvement for those cows considered to have more of a severe case of the disorder. So ba based on these data is that we started hypothesizing in a way that uh, the, the system uh, would be able of identifying those cows that have more of a a severe case of the disorder 
but it will be less able to identify mild cases of the disorder. So you can see here in terms of timing, not a substantial difference, not, not, not a significant difference either. So, you know, in order to support this idea to, you know, say, well, you know, these cows are different, right? The cows with the mild versus the uh, uh, more severe cases of metritis are not necessarily equal. And uh, we looked at a few other outcomes of interest. So here you have just an example. This is milk production for the five days preceding diagnosis of metritis. So from minus five to the day of diagnosis of metritis. And the three groups represented in here are in green cows that were healthy. So therefore there was no, no metritis. Red cows were the cows that were diagnosed with metritis and there was an alert. So that's why you see here HI positive, basically an alert uh, from the system, which is the health index score uh, from, from SCR. So there was an alert for the cows in red and the cows in blue are those ones that were diagnosed with metritis by farm personnel. However, there was not an alert from the system. And these are the, the cows that we uh, hypothesized that had more of a milder case of the disorder as opposed to the ones with an alert that we hypothesized that have more of a severe case of the disorder. And uh, in a way, I mean, supporting this, this notion, you can see how cows that did have an alert uh, had reduced milk production in comparison to both healthy cows and cows diagnosed with metritis, but without an alert. And this was the case for first lactation cows, as well as for multipurpose cows, where you can see the exact same pattern, just the different level of milk production. But clearly those cows for which there was an alert, uh, they had lower milk production. So if, uh, if milk production is any indication of overall health of a cow, then it seems like you know, the separation of cows based on alerts may, you know, actually be in line with the idea of mild versus severe case and that the technology and the alert system is capable of identifying those cows uh, that have a more severe case of the disorder. So this was the case for metritis, uh, but then uh, we also had cows with mastitis, as you would expect, and the overall sensitivity was also in the um, 50% range, almost uh, 60% in this case for clinical cases. For those cases in which there was an alert, the alert actually happened 1.2 days earlier uh, than clinical diagnosis by farm personnel. Uh, it is not significantly different, but you know, uh, from a practical perspective, and I guess you can argue that uh, it's somewhat earlier. Uh, but just like for metritis, I mean, not all cases of mastitis are equal. Right, so we have the advantage of having the uh, uh, results for culture milk out of each one of the cases of clinical mastitis that um, were identified in the trial, and then we went on to separate uh, cows based on the pathogen isolated. And as you may know, most of you must know that cases of mastitis associated with E. coli they, they tend to be toxic cases of mastitis in which you know, the health of the cow is, is compromised beyond the uh, mammary gland, beyond the other. And therefore the expectation would be that uh, the system would be able to identify those cows a little bit better than other types of mastitis in which the uh, overall health of the cow is not affected as much. The uh, inflammation and infection is, is just isolated in the mammary tissue. And indeed, that is what we observe. So you can see how the sensitivity for cases of E. coli uh, was 81%, and for all other cases of mastitis, including cases with no growth, and some cases that are more uh, associated with chronic types of mastitis and subclinical mastitis, the sensitivity was, was lower than the average for all cases and, and relatively low. So anyway, again, uh, uh, more data in this case from another disorder, in this case from mastitis, supporting this idea that 
at least this system in particular, uh, would be capable of identifying more of the severe cases of these disorders and, and it would not detect the milder cases of the disorder when you know, the overall health or the systemic health of the cow or, or the cow is not affected systemically by, by the health disorder. So uh, in summary for uh, this study, uh, we, we again observed that for metabolic and digestive disorders, uh, the, the system was pretty good in terms of the ability to identify cows and the alerts were generated relatively earlier in relationship to the time of clinical diagnosis. However, for metritis and mastitis, the results were, were not as, as good, right? So we had overall sensitivities in the 50 to 60% range. However, the, there's a pretty substantial difference between uh, animals that seem to have more of a mild versus severe case of the disorder. So uh, from a practical perspective, I mean, we then um, speculated that uh, for a system like this one, uh, you know, there would be potential to utilize it on farm to identify cows with metabolic and digestive disorders and expect to have relatively decent overall performance. However, for vitritis, mastitis, and any other disorder that uh, the system is not as accurate at identifying, then so th there is potential to use the technology in a way, uh, potentially use it as an initial screening method, but then uh, it should be used in combination with other methods with you know, traditional ways of screening cows for health disorders such as visual observation or conduct a specific uh, a clinical examination at a specific day, day in milk or days in milk. So anyway, so th those are the, the main uh, conclusions in a way from the study, but I, I have to remind you that this, this was done uh, in a way in a retrospective manner, right? It's not that we were looking for cows with health disorders, utilizing the alerts from the system. This was all done retrospectively, farm personnel conducting clinical diagnosis were blind to the alerts because we did not want to bias uh, the identification of cows uh, in terms of the actual uh, identification of the animal with the disorder, but also the timing. So, um, because of course this, this would not answer all our questions and, and more importantly answer the question on whether or not uh, a technology like this one uh, or parameters monitored by this kind of technology could be used prospectively, okay, or basically to run a health monitoring program at a commercial dairy farm. So we, we felt that that question was not answered uh, by our previous study, is that we conducted a follow-up study uh, at a commercial dairy farm. And um, I have to uh, take a moment here. I'll get back to this, uh, of course, at the end, but. Uh, you know, mentioned that this was a study sponsored by the New York Farm Viability Institute, which is uh, an institution that provides funding uh, to um, uh, researchers to conduct practical research such as this one. So anyway, uh, we work with the commercial dairy farm and, and we conducted this study as a randomized control experiment. So we enroll about 1200 cows and we randomized them into two different groups. So we had a control group and a treatment group, which I'll go on to um, describe in a moment. Uh, but one very important thing about the trial is that cows were commingled at all times and were managed equally throughout the duration of the experiment. The only difference between cows in the control and the treatment group was the way in which cows were identified for clinical examination during the fresh period. Cows in the control group were examined every single day for the first 10 days in milk, no matter what. So they were sorted for an examination and a clinical exam was conducted for the first 10 days in milk. In addition to that, we also had data from daily milk weights and we had visual observation. And by that, I mean, a walkthrough of the pen of fresh cows before milking. So this is what we did for the control group. And then uh, for the first 10 days in milk, and then from 10 to about 30 days in milk, 35 days when they uh, uh, left the fresh pen, uh, cows were monitored in a way or screened through 
the use of daily meal weights and visual observation before milking. So in a way, what we were trying to replicate with this group, it was what uh, some dairies, and of course there's a lot of variation in terms of what dairy farms do at the time of uh, you know, identifying cows with health disorders. But we, we thought that this was representative of what dairies with somewhat intensive programs do to identify cows with health disorders. Uh, of course, we could argue all day whether or not this was the, uh, uh, the, the right control group, okay? But we, we wanted to have uh, something that we, we think we consider to be relatively uh, common for farms with intensive health monitoring programs. On the other hand, for the treatment group, the idea was simple. The idea was to only check cows or conduct clinical examination on cows for which there was an alert from the automated health monitoring systems that we had in place. And I'll describe this in a little more detail, but basically uh, for these groups of cows were only sorted for clinical examination if we had an alert from the health ID score from the SCR system. So once again, so we use for this experiment, the neck tags from, from SCR. So we also use the individual cow graphs for rumination activity in case that there was any suspicion that a cow needed attention. So we looked at the individual uh, graphs for, for cows for rumination activity. We did use daily meal weight data as well because we think that a lot of dairies that are more likely to use the uh, type of technology such as rumination activity or any of the uh, other automated systems are likely to already have daily meal weights. And of course, we also had visual observation uh, before milking has our safety net, assuming based on what we knew and what we expected that not all cows that needed attention would be identified by either one of the automated systems that we had in place during the trial. We wanted to have a safety net to make sure that no cows would go without proper attention and without proper clinical examination in case that they, they needed to be treated or they needed some sort of intervention. But again, just uh, to recap, the idea was to compare uh, this uh, strategy using mostly or primarily alerts from the automated systems versus a traditional intensive health monitoring program uh, conducted through uh, uh, clinical examination of cows by days in milk and visual observation, and as well as uh, daily milk production. So uh, in a little bit more detail here, so uh, we use again this health index score, you know, this is a value and an alert system generated by the software from the SCR system. Anytime that a cow has a value of less than 86 points, she shows up in this report. And that's exactly what we did. We, we pulled every morning the list of cows with less than 86 points for a clinical examination. This is the way that the system should be used in, you know, based on the recommendations of the company uh, in order to identify cows with disorders. Again, as I mentioned, we did use the individual cow graphs for rumination and physical activity in case that we had uh, you know, any doubts or there were cows that were not in this report that were identified through visual observation. And we wanted to make sure that uh, there was a good reason for the animal to be sorted and checked. And then uh, we also use uh, daily milk yield data. So we basically use uh, uh, the drop in milk production between two sessions. So we use a cutoff of 15% in production rate, which this is generated by the parlor system. In this case was AFI. So uh, any uh, percent reduction of more than 15% between the last two milking sessions was, was considered to be an alert and cows were evaluated. So uh, every morning we, we generated a list of cows that were included uh, in these alert systems. And uh, based on that, the list of cows to check for the treatment group was generated. So again, so the only difference between the groups was the way that cows were selected to be examined, okay? So the control group, as I described, was done one way, the treatment group another way. However, once the cow was, uh, sorted and was available for clinical examination. 
the actual clinical examination was conducted, uh, conducted exactly the same way through uh, direct observation. You know, the cow was evaluated uh, from front to back. Body temperature was taken. Urine ketones were evaluated. Cows with a non-negative result were also bled and BHBs were measured in blood. We use auscultation, we use the metric check device to evaluate vaginal and urinary discharge, and we also have milk culture data uh, for cases of clinical mastitis. So anyway, just to give you, a, you know, an idea of how we did it, and in this case, it was all done by technicians from our research team which uh, visited, who visited the farm seven days a week, unfortunately for them. So, uh, in terms of uh, results, so the, the first thing that I want to point out is that most of the results are still sound. I think they will not change dramatically, but this is a study uh, for which we collected a tremendous amount of data and we are still processing some, some of the data. So I think for, from a practical perspective, the, the results, I, I think that they are very close to be a uh, uh, what we need for decision making, but more for our research purposes, uh, the way that we do things for research and publications, we, we still may have some minor changes along the way. So please keep keep that in mind and stay tuned, you know, for the time that we have our final results. So I'll start by uh, just presenting uh, first the uh, uh, the number or percentage of recorded health events for both the control and the treatment group and whether or not there was a difference. And here you can see we have the data for all events combined as well as individual health events of interest. So uh, in general, our thinking is that uh, the results are good. You can see there was, this, you know, there was a statistical tendency or a difference depending on how you want to look at it that indicated that more cows were identified or more health events were observed for the control group than the treatment group, and that difference is about five percentage points. So, uh, so this is certainly, you know, relevant, it's important. However, from a practical perspective, I mean, we, we are pretty satisfied with the performance of the treatment group, thinking that at least it, it didn't break the system, right? It's not that half of the health events were missed, it's not that you know half of the cows or 20%, 30% of the cows that potentially needed attention were not identified. So yes, you know there is here a difference. You know we'll see how the results look like at the end when we have 100% certainty of health events and so on. Uh, but at least they they look encouraging, right? So uh, it doesn't seem like the treatment strategy messed a very high percentage of cows that would be problematic from a practical perspective. And of course, you will see, uh, you know, the upcoming herd performance data, which seems to suggest that this was potentially not a big problem. But anyway, so when looking at individual health disorders as well, so there are some differences uh, and probably the uh, uh, type of event that explain quite a bit of the difference between the control and treatment group is clinical ketosis. Uh, there were about two and a half percentage point more cases of clinical ketosis identified in the control group than in the treatment group. And this was a statistical tendency. You know, the other thing to keep in mind, I mean, we are always making the assumption that uh, the uh, incidence of health disorders should be exactly the same between the control and treatment group. And, you know, of course, we do have quite a few animals in each treatment group, however, I mean, we, we could have been impacted by random chance and just the fact that there were some cows, oh, that, that there were fewer cows in one group versus the other, okay? So please, you know, take this data uh, or, you know, make your conclusions about it, this data within the context of some of the limitations of the study. We have a lot of ways to uh, then retrospectively see whether some cows were missed or not, but we are not there yet. Uh, we, we are still evaluating the data. But uh, another piece of data that is very interesting and, and is uh, in a way related to that data, and it's, uh, I think, very important, is the percentage of cows that were sold and died within 60 or 150 days in milk. Okay. And, you know, why do I say that this is important? Well, you know, if there were a lot of cows that were 
missed, that had a healthy bend and were missed in the treatment group, and they actually needed attention, one would expect that those cows had some consequences down the line and that they would be sold or would end up dying. And uh, fortunately, that didn't seem to be the case. So we did not observe any difference in uh, percentage of cows sold or dead within 60 or 150 days of milk. Again, suggesting that you know, if some cows were missed, they, they didn't have very severe cases of whatever disorder they had, and therefore, you know, they they you know they did relatively well, at least from the perspective of not being sold and die. Another very important outcome, of course, is milk production. So we looked at milk production uh, for the first 22 weeks of lactation. So here you have the lactation curves for the first 22 weeks. So we did not observe statistically significant differences for milk production uh, when conducted as a repeated measurement analysis on a weekly basis. But uh, we also looked at a few other parameters, a few other indicators of milk production. So pig milk, average daily milk for five weeks, and then total milk for five and 22 weeks. So except for a statistical tendency for pig milk production, which indicated that cows in the control group produced uh, 600 grams more of milk per day at peak. And you can actually, in a way, appreciate that there on the graph. You know, uh, th there was no difference for average daily milk production, no difference for total milk production. So uh, we really wish that we didn't observe this difference, a little puzzling, I mean, as to what are the true consequences of this, okay? but. Uh, uh, when looking at average and total milk production, it didn't seem like uh, there were any differences. And again, looking by week, there was no uh, no difference. So it didn't seem like you know the way that we manage cows in either group uh, had an impact on milk production performance in lactation. Very quickly, I'll just uh, uh, go through the repro data. We also looked at uh, reproductive outcomes for first service. So no significant differences for cows inseminated at detected estrus. Of course, no difference for cows inseminated on time AI because they are just the cows that are left and no differences for average days in milk to the first service. So uh, it seems like uh, you know, there would be no major consequences uh, on reproductive outcomes when cows are managed with a strategy similar to that of the treatment group. Uh, there are some numerical trends there that you know I really would not like to see, but you know statistically uh, there is not a significant difference. And the same thing with uh, pregnancies per AI or conception rate. So there are no differences when all services are combined, and then there are no differences when we only look at inseminations at detected estrus or inseminations through time AI. So again, in summary, so there, there didn't seem to be uh, significant or substantial differences in terms of reproductive outcomes. So to summarize everything you know, for, for this study in terms of health outcomes and the consequences on health performance, it seems like uh, conducting you know, or running a health monitoring program for fresh cows in early lactation with automated, estrus, uh, automated uh, health monitoring systems that monitor the parameters that were monitored by the ones that we use, so milk production, rumination, activity, and, and generating the type of alerts that we generated, uh, we could expect to have uh, no major consequences from, from a herd performance perspective. However, probably the, uh, the other aspect of this is uh, the, uh, uh, the value of conducting uh, the uh, or monitoring cows with these automated technologies more than anything on labor reductions, which is one aspect of this that I didn't discuss in a lot of detail before, but it's critical. So one of the potential advantages of these technologies can be uh, the value on uh, reducing labor, in particular for farms that have these intensive health monitoring programs that require a lot of attention from farm personnel. So anyway, I'll discuss this very, very quickly uh, because the, the uh, economics are in a way for now um, more applicable to the conditions of our study. We, we still have to do a lot of work to see how this can be generalized. So, you know, just uh, 
just for you to know, so we, we conducted a pretty detailed analysis, and, and the main idea was what was the economic value of the potential reduction in labor requirements. So with the, you know, the cost savings from having less time spent looking for cows, can we actually afford to buy the equipment necessary to run, uh, to, to install and operate uh, the automated systems? So we, we calculated different things, you know, labor reductions from different number of reductions in number of people. And um, we used the data during the trial. We had several assumptions, uh, no major differences in, in disease, no differences in anything related to health performance. The only difference would be on the amount of labor saved. And of course, we have to use different uh, lifespans for the systems three, five, seven years account for uh, lost tags or, or, you know, repairs for the systems. And we also made the assumption that it was only used for health. Uh, again, some of these systems in particular, the, the one with activity uh, can be used for estrus detection. We completely ignore that. And then we had, you know, uh, cost of labor, uh, cost of the equipment, uh, both for uh, the sensor tags on, on cows, the wearables, as well as the parlor. And we had the, the total reduction in uh, cows check and amount of hours spent checking cows. And this is where I'll spend you know, a, a little bit more time. So conceptually, you can see in here, what is the difference? So what is the amount of labor saved by going with the treatment strategy versus the control strategy? Okay, and so that, that's the concept here. So uh, these numbers that you see here, so 8,760 cows less would be checked with the treatment strategy versus the control strategy, which would reduce the number of hours that each individual, each person would spend checking cows by 426 hours. Okay, so that's the concept here. So with these labor saving costs, can we actually pay for the wearable technologies and can we pay for the technology needed for the power? In the interest of time, I'll not go through this in detail, I'll just jump into the conclusions. So just want you to know that we conducted it in a way a detailed sensitivity analysis to you know figure out the things that I'll, that I'll tell you now as part of the conclusions. If anybody has questions, I'm very happy to, to answer them. As, as we go or at the end. So uh, again, long story short, um, it seems like when the lifespan of the uh, automated uh, systems is three years, uh, it's really difficult to make it break even at all the different labor costs and considering all the possible reductions in a number of workers. And this is even assuming uh, you know a thousand dollar cost per stall of uh, daily millway data, which you know is somewhat of a conservative uh, value for that. So when the lifespan of the system is five years, now uh, it breaks even at all labor costs when there is a reduction in, in two workers. Okay, this is making the assumption that we go from four people to two people uh, evaluating cows. And when we have a, a lesser labor reduction, uh, it only breaks even when labor costs are pretty high. And I went really fast through that, but just to remind you, we use 10, 12 and a half and $15 per hour uh, of labor cost. And then uh, when, when the system or the systems uh, have a lifespan of about seven years, then things look a, a whole lot better for them. Uh, the technologies will break even uh, pretty much under every scenario, uh, except when the reduction in labor is, is minimal and uh, when labor cost is really low, right? So the, the, the cheaper it is to do it with uh, personnel, you know, the more difficult it becomes for the technology to break even. So again, I apologize for going through so quickly through this. Again, if anybody has questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Just wanted to give you a very general idea of the things to think about and um, what are some of the uh, punchlines? What are some of the main outcomes uh, uh, that we observe from our trial? So just to finish uh, the, uh, uh, the presentation, I'll discuss briefly uh, how farms can integrate these technologies. 
So uh, we have a, a variety of programs on farms in terms of what they do and how they do it. Uh, we have all the way from farms that barely check their cows and have uh, programs that are very uh, laid back all the way to farms that have very intensive programs, checking cows as much as twice per day using a uh, systematic uh, help, you know, uh, SOP or set of SOPs to check cows. So I, I want to argue, or would like to make the argument that there are two types of farms. There are those ones that have very, to, uh, very little to no intervention. And in those cases, I think that farms can benefit a lot from identifying cows with health disorders that they are not identifying today. Of course, we are making the assumption that there is a benefit to identify those cows, intervene, and uh, that would affect their health and performance. And then on the other hand, we have farms that are you know, completely opposite. They have this very, very intense, or intensive, I should say, intensive health monitoring programs. For these farms, I, I think that the opportunity is not as much on the ability to identify cows with health disorders because they are probably pretty good at it. The benefit is, is most likely to be the potential to reduce labor and reduce cow manipulation. So again, the, the message here is that within the whole spectrum of farms and programs implemented by farms to identify cows with health disorders, I think that there may be a place for these technologies and the benefit, uh, the type of benefit and the degree or magnitude of the difference uh, of the benefit will change or will depend on what the farm is doing at the moment and what will change when we start implementing the technology. So we put together uh, three different potential ways of using these technologies on farms uh, based on what we know today. Of course, there's a lot more research going on and we are trying to see what are the best ways to use them. And they go from the least used to the most use of the technology. The very first one is one in which, and here you can see, so what I have here is a fictitious uh, fresh cow list. So I'm going to make the assumption that once a day, the farm generates a list of cows to check, okay? So the point that I'll make is, you know, what are the different ways to generate this list of cows and how these technologies, automated health monitoring systems, can help modify this list and modify what farms do. In the first case, the list is not generated based on data from the automated system. We do have data integrated in the list, but the data is, is not used to drive which cows are included in the list. So we continue to do it based on traditional methods you know, whether it's days in milk, visual observation, or previous treatments, whatever way the farm is doing it. So this is uh, a case in which we will not necessarily reduce the number of cows to monitor. So again, we are not changing who goes into the list uh, to be checked. All that we may benefit from the technology is improve the accuracy of diagnosis. It's just having these additional parameters that if we believe that there are indicators of cow health, that we can use to help whatever other methods we have to define disease or to you know, consider a cow as having a health issue. So we, we may just improve the accuracy of diagnosis, but we are not changing the way that we generate the list. Of course, this is the least use of the technology and one that I personally, I'm not the most excited about, right? So I don't think that this takes full advantage of the potential value of the technology. The next one is, is a hybrid, it's a combination. In this case, the, uh, the list is generated through a combination of traditional methods and the data from the automated health monitoring system. So some cows are included here because of alerts or because of certain parameters from the system. And some cows are included because of whatever, days in milk, visual observation, or whatever it is. So in this case, we may help reduce the number of cows to monitor. You know, it depends, again, on the sensitivity and specificity of the technology or technologies that are being used. And once again, we, we may improve the accuracy of diagnosis, uh, you know, especially, you know, for those cows that are not added in the list because of the automated health monitoring system. 
And last is the, uh, the strategy, which I think it, it would be the ideal from the perspective of making the most use of the technology. And this is one in which only cows that have an alert or for which there is data from the technology that suggests that the cow should be checked is included in the list. So we go from a longer list of cows to check and, and, and some that in theory should not be evaluated based on the technology to a much shorter list of cows that only include those ones that need attention based on the data from the technology. And so the concept is to go from a, a longer list to a shorter list that only includes those animals that hypothetically need attention. So the idea is that you know, it will help reduce the number of cows to monitor. The potential drawback, and this is very dependent on the type of technology, is that some cows may be missed. And this is you know, if the technology you know, does not have the ability to identify all cases that are of our interest. Of course, this is a very gray area. You know, what are we interested as a farm to find? So are we interested in finding even the mildest cases of uh, you know, mitritis or any other disorder, or are, are we okay with finding certain cases of disorders that we, we believe or we have data that suggests that we're actually helping the cow if we put her through a treatment or any type of intervention. So anyway, just to recap, we, we went from, you know, again, a system or a way of doing it in which we make the least use of the technology is just, you know, to help with diagnosis, then we have a combination, and finally we have one that makes the most use of the technology and ideally helps us reduce the uh, number of cows to check. In cases in which we either know or suspect that not all cases of interest will be identified, what we can still do is uh, combine um, you know, the technology, the data from the technology with traditional methods, but uh, in a very, uh, non-intensive manner, I would say. And the concept here is to, I mean, if we know uh, when most of the cases of the particular disorder occur, and I'm just giving here an example with detritus. So, you know, we, we kind of, you know, graph or, or we, we figure out when the most uh, cases are usually identified for the dairy. So when we have the timeline here for, uh, uh, the health monitoring program. So what we do is, uh, so we combine the data from the automated health monitoring system with checks at a specific days in milk that are defined based on the pattern of occurrence of the disorder. So the idea is that we let the technology do the initial screening, we let the technology find the uh, most severe cases of the disorders of interest but then we have these, these checks at specific days in milk that, that we use as a safety net to make sure that no cows are going away, that no cows may have a disorder that we are interested on dealing with uh, without being identified. So that's, that's kind of the idea. And this is one case that can be, you know, it's almost, I mean, somewhat similar to the second case that I showed. I mean, it just depends on how intensive we want to be with these specific checks at a certain days in time. So um, just to uh, finish, uh, very quickly, I just want to touch on, on a few things that uh, I would uh, keep in mind when considering the adoption of these technologies. So, uh, you know, I would say that in general, you know, I say it depends, right? It depends on what exactly we want to do, uh, what will dictate the type of technology and you know, whether we use tags or sensors for certain cows or all cows, or whether we use it just for health monitoring versus repro or both. So that's important to consider. Uh, keep in mind the potential labor implications of replacing tags uh, for some of the systems that uh, the tags can be reused or if we buy fewer tags than 100% of uh, the herd, then uh, it's important to keep in mind what would it take to replace tax? And of course, economics. Absolutely critical uh, potential for or lack of 
potential for integrating the technology with other technologies. This is becoming more and more critical as we have uh, more and more of these technologies. So I, I would highly consider the, the uh, potential to integrate them. There are very important consequences as far as benefits as well as drawbacks of integrating or not being able to integrate data from the different technologies. I, I like to say that to me, uh, the possibility of integrating the data with multiple other systems, you know, may have 30 to 40% of the total value of some of these technologies. Last but not least here, uh, having good technical support. Uh, we have learned this the hard way in all our research trials and our interactions with farms. It is absolutely critical to uh, have somebody to lean on when things go wrong. So uh, I personally think that there's a lot of value on this. And why? Well, there are a lot of issues with, with this. Technology. We still have problems with them even today. Of course, they are improving by the day. Um, some of them are more reliable than others, but we have all sorts of issues that we have to deal with on a daily basis that are important to keep in mind at the time of considering implementing some of these technologies. We have, uh, just to give you examples, uh, the system goes down, problems with internet connections, antennas, readers that don't work, tags that fail, issues with placement of the tags on the cows or around cows, misidentifications, problems with activations, and then some other issues that are more related to other management practices that may affect uh, the outcome of the use of the technology. So these are just some examples, you know, some things I could, I could spend a good amount of time discussing, you know, uh, what are the, the implications and the most common issues that we have with this. Uh, money, you know, there's time to spend on these technologies too with software updates and, you know, uh, learning curves with uh, changes in user interfaces uh, and, and different um, changes that come with software updates. Calibrations for some of the system, they have to be calibrated every so often to make sure that the data uh, is properly collected. And then also take into account uh, uh, the, the amount of data required to collect baseline data. Most of the systems use uh, prior data from the same individual to, to make predictions. And therefore, the, there are some implications of that as far as uh, when uh, the uh, technology should be used. So uh, we made it to the end. So I once again want to thank uh, uh, the New York Farm Viability, which funded uh, our uh, second project, the one that I discussed, and, and, uh, from which we, we learned a lot. And uh, you know, I also want to thank everybody and, and every other uh, company or institution that makes my research possible. Of course, my people, uh, my graduate students, undergraduate students and technicians, uh, multiple companies that support our, our research in different ways, uh, the funding agencies, and, and of course, the commercial farms that allow us to, to do uh, this research, which you know, is usually uh, a lot of commitment from these farms and we are very grateful for what they allow us to do. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I hope that you don't look like the guy that I show at the beginning sleeping on your desk. <laughs>